we're already here. Hi, everybody. It's me, the Fetch, host of Inside the Eye of Lying. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fed, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm your host, Janet Kier Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and today we have a very special show with our guest, Kathleen Martin. Kathleen is known around the world for her work as a UFO abduction, ET contact researcher, experiencer, rights advocate, author, and lecturer. She has 24 years' experience in the field, and she has served as MUFON's Director of Abduction Research. In 2012, MUFON named her Ufologist of the Year. She has earned a BA degree in social work from the University of New Hampshire in 1971. She's participated in graduate studies in education. She has extensive training in hypnosis, and her Interest in UFOs dates back to September 20th, 1961, which is a very famous date in UFO history, when her Aunt Betty Hill phoned her nearby home to report that she and Barney had encountered a flying saucer <clears throat> in New Hampshire's White Mountains. And she's a primary witness to the evidence of the UFO encounter and the aftermath and Kathleen has intimate knowledge of the Hill's biographical histories, personalities, and the previously unpublished historical files pertaining to their sensational story. Kathleen is the author of three books, Captured, The Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, Science is, Was Wrong with Nuclear Physicist Stanton T. Friedman, and The Alien Abduction Files with co-author Denise Stoner. Dr. Lesson, what would you like to say before we bring Kathleen on? Uh, yeah, we've been uh, interviewing so many people that have way different contact experiences, all the way from uh, being seized and used uh, by aliens under Dulce and other places as a result of trees with the American government. <clears throat> uh, uh, um, our um, secret uh, admiralty actually abducting people to confuse them all the way to people that are happily contactees and things are getting better and they're having babies and having a lot of fun. And so we're hoping that, you, I know you've really looked at this mature, you can give us some kind of uh, clarity on what you think is, is happening and whether things are changing and if uh, we're looking forward to this show. Yes, we're looking very forward to the show. So welcome, Kathleen, and, and would you like to add anything to your biographical history to tell our listeners about who you are and your work. Oh, well, oh, thank you. It's thanks. great to be with you. And, uh, gee, what else could I add? <laughs> I have been doing this for 24 years now. Um, I was 13 years old when my Aunt Betty phoned my mother. I was home that day, and so I was knowledgeable and, and uh, in on this from the very beginning. 
Uh, it was quite shocking, quite an experience for me at age 13 because it was something that my family didn't discuss. We were very interested in politics and in civil rights and uh, social justice, but uh, had almost no knowledge whatsoever of UFOs, except for a strange object my mother had seen in the sky way back in 1958, and I didn't even know about that. She'd never told me. So uh, I became fascinated, I guess, on that day, and I've never lost that fascination. The more I study, uh, the more I realize how little I actually understand, and that's what drives me is to to gain an understanding of what actually is going on here. Wow. Well, where was that? Where were you living when you received that call? You lived close to Betty and Barney, and, and was your was your mother or sisters? Was it, were they sisters? Your mother well, and Betty. My, my childhood home was uh, about 20 miles away from Betty's and Barney's home. I grew up in Kingston, New Hampshire. They lived in Portsmouth on the seacoast. I was actually born in Portsmouth, and my parents lived in uh, one of Betty's uh, apartments when when I was an infant. And then we moved to Kingston, New Hampshire, across the street, actually, from my grandparents' farm. And mm-hmm. Uh, Betty was my mother's older sister. She was 10 years older than my mother, one of five children. Oh, okay. So she was 10 years difference. Yes. So um, so you were there when the call came through. So you were a direct witness to your mother uh, having this conversation with her sister. Yes, is that correct? that is correct. That's so you, correct. Do you recall what was said or what your mother said or... Her emotional oh, yes. <laughs> Tell us it's, about that, please. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty indelible uh, on my mind because it was so shocking to me, I think. Uh, I was home from school. Uh, I believe I went to school that day, and, and then I was out for the day. I know that there was a hurricane coming, but I don't think I had the day off from school. It was the afternoon, late afternoon, and mm-hmm. uh, my mother had received the phone call, and Betty was very concerned that the the UFO, as she called it a flying saucer, had mm-hmm. come so close to them that it. Uh, she was afraid they'd been contaminated. She'd had Bonnie uh, leave the clothing, the suitcases, out on the, the back porch. She didn't want them taken into the house. Uh, they had a cooler of food that they were carrying with them. They discarded that. They'd taken long showers. And she uh, asked my mother if she might talk to a neighbor of ours who was a physicist to find out what he would suggest um, if they could have been contaminated and, and what they should do. And my mother did get in touch with the physicist. And for some reason, and I'll never know why, he must have known about um, magnetic fields um, around UFOs because he told Betty that if she had a compass, she should take the compass out to the car to see how the needle on the compass would react. Mm -hmm. She took it out, and she hung up the phone. She took it out, and um, she, for the first time, discovered spots, shiny spots on the trunk of the car that hadn't been there the day before. They were all the same size, highly polished circles. And she held the compass near the back of the car uh, over those spots, and the needle on the compass would spin and spin. But when she moved the compass away from the spots to another part of the car, the needle would drop down. Now, Mm -hmm. we know now that this uh, has been observed in other cases where – Individuals have been abducted uh, by... Would it affect their jewelry or or anything metallic on their bodies if they had a pacer or pacemaker or anything like that? They didn't have pacemakers. Each of them was wearing a wind-up watch that Mm -hmm. night, and the watches had stopped. They never worked again. Okay. And um, was she suspecting uh, radiation, or what, what what do you think she was thinking of? Oh, yeah, she was very worried about radiation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And that's wow. the reason for taking the long showers and leaving everything outside. Okay, so they found that this was uh, um, re- responding to the... Whom did they tell? Yeah, so they told your mother, and what was your mother's response? Did she? Did you hear her giving advice or empathy or anything like that? Um, yes, my, my mother was concerned as well, but we were all very, very curious. We wanted to see these spots on the car. Um, and uh, so we started to make plans to drive down to Betty's and Barney's house. While we were mm-hmm. doing that, one of my father's best friends, who was a former police officer in Newton, New Hampshire, which was a town over from where I grew up, uh, came in. And he advised Betty and Barney to make a report to Pease Air Force Base. Uh, and so they did. They called Pease and, and they filed a Project Blue Book report stating uh, that they had observed an object uh, for at least an hour and that uh, at closest range they estimated that it was the size of a dinner plate at arm's length. So that will give you an idea of how huge this object was as, as they looked up at it, as it hovered over their car. What was the um, mindset of the, of the people back in 1961? You know, here we are many, many years later. But thought they were Russians. Yeah. <laughs> Did they think... Uh, uh, extraterrestrials, did they think uh, uh, something reverse engineered from our own scientists? Did they think invasion? W- what was the mindset back then? Well, when Betty and Barney were looking up at this, uh, they were attempting to explain it as uh, something else when it was in a distance, at a distance. And it was, uh, they were looking at a light in the sky at that point. They just, they thought that it might be a satellite. Mm. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of interest in Sputnik at, during that time and uh, the space race between Russia and the United States. And uh, so that's what they first thought it might be. From there, they speculated that it might be uh, Piper Cub or it might be a fighter jet, but it was completely silent. And it moved in an unconventional uh, flight path, uh, sort of a zigzag pattern, a fair stair step pattern. It hovered silently overhead. And so this was very perplexing because obviously it was not uh, anything that they had ever seen before. Mm-hmm. They did, It didn't cross their minds that it might be Russians. Oh. Okay. It was, they, they thought it was extraterrestrial. I saw things back in the 60s, and I immediately went to UFOs, but I was one of those kids that was way out there. But other people might think differently. Um, so what were Betty and Barney like as people? Who were you closest with, your aunt or your uncle? And uh, what was your relationship like with them? I have to say I have- that I was close to both Betty and Barney. Uh, I had, of course, known Betty longer than I knew Barney. Uh, So uh, we were very, very close. She was almost like a second mother to me. We did a lot of things together. Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire, and I admired her for um, her independence, for uh, going to college and becoming a social worker, a child welfare worker. She worked in uh, adoptions as well and was later promoted to supervisor. And uh, Barney worked for the post office, but he was actively involved in the civil rights movement in the state of New Hampshire. He and Betty were actually members of the NAACP. Uh, Barney was legal redress for the regional board. Uh, They uh, had set up, helped to set up the Rockingham County Community Action Program uh, through the Office of Economic Opportunity. And Sergeant Shriver had actually awarded uh, Barney uh, an award for having done these really good things for the people in New Hampshire. The governor had, uh, in 1965, appointed him to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission State Advisory Committee uh, because the initial committee uh, was comprised of five white men. And Barney was outraged that five white men 
would be making those decisions uh, about people of color in the state of New Hampshire. And he had made phone calls. He'd made public speeches. He had written uh, pages or letters to the newspaper. And he had gained recognition. He was a very brave man. And uh, he was eventually uh, invited to serve on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission State Advisory Committee. So this was a big thing. Uh, Barney was politically active in the state. I had a great deal of admiration for Betty and Barney uh, for the activities that they participated in and encouraged me to participate in. Uh, the three of us were invited to Lyndon Johnson's inauguration, for example. This was, 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 Barney risky, was he risking uh, his career by uh, reporting this? Was he endangering his career? Uh, he was definitely endangering his career, but he reported it only to the Air Force and to NICAP, and this was a confidential investigation. He and Betty were willing only to talk to investigators confidentially and also to scientists. That was that was going to be it. Of course, we in the family knew, but we were sworn to secrecy as well. So this was never to be made public. How did they meet? Uh, Barney was visiting what? Portsmouth, New Hampshire uh, in the summer. Uh, he was just on vacation. He was going to Hampton Beach. And Betty had moved her apartment building. She'd sold it, actually, to a garage um, that was going to be going into that place. And then she'd had it moved. And while she uh, was having it re redone, uh, she was staying in a boarding house. And Barney ended up staying in the same boarding house. And, and uh, that is how they met, actually. They met there and discovered that they had many similar interests and objectives and goals. And uh, so they continued a relationship where they wrote to each other, they'd talk on the phone. He would go to visit Betty. They never intended to marry, but mm -hmm. after several years of writing and visiting, uh, they did get married. We've been finding in our research that a lot of uh, couples, uh, contacting couples, their um, romance, their meeting, their relationship was somehow orchestrated by extraterrestrials. So I wonder if you have any clues or indications that they may have been directed to meet each other on some level by the extraterrestrials. I have no clues or indications of that whatsoever. Okay. Just asking because we've been finding a, a pattern there. So do you think that either of them had experiences before the 1961 experience? We, we don't know what the quality of the night, uh, of their experience as it unfolds. All we know is, is what they saw. What else happened? Okay. We can go into the experience, but I just wanted to know if you think that if in your research, if they have had, you know, a lot of these contactees we're finding with the modern research, it goes back to their childhood. Yes, absolutely. But Betty and Barney had no memory of it going back before that fateful night on September 19, 1961. When they were driving home from a short vacation, uh, almost no one knew that they had taken this vacation. It was impromptu. Uh, actually, I had been to Niagara Falls with my Aunt June, who, that was Betty's sister, the month before that, and my cousin and my uncle, we had a wonderful time. We uh, took a lot of photographs, and Betty had never been to Niagara Falls. So Barney decided to surprise her with a trip when she had a week's vacation from her job at the welfare department. And uh, he asked for a few days off, and you know they, they left on uh, not a well-planned trip at all, for Niagara Falls, and they had little money, and they put no credit cards in those days, no cell phones in those days. Uh, they did drive up to Montreal after that. They were going to spend the night in Montreal, but then they decided at the last minute that they would just drive on back to New Hampshire, and if they grew tired on their way home, they would stop someplace for the night. Mm -hmm. And that was it. As they were driving through northern New Hampshire, Betty's attention was drawn to a new light in the sky. 
uh, she it moved so rapidly that she thought it might have been a falling star initially, only it fell upward, not downward, the way a fl- falling star does. Right. And she continued, it stopped in the sky, and she continued to watch it as it grew larger and larger. Uh, she was calling Barney's attention to it, uh, and finally asked him to stop, to get out of the car so she could get a better look at this thing. She was trying to identify what it was. So he actually did stop, finally, and uh, they had their little dog, Delphi, with them. She was a dachshund, and he walked the dog while Betty looked at this thing through binoculars. Uh, She saw it with flashing multicolored lights that crossed over the face of the moon, and then it started to move uh, westerly toward uh, Vermont. Barney took the binoculars when Betty returned to the car, And without looking as if it had turned, it just shot back at him. And it was quite low at that time. He could see the windows in it. And uh, this was rather distressing because he was trying to convince himself that it was only a commercial airliner on the way to Montreal. And obviously, this is not what it was. Uh, He got back into the car, too, and started driving through an area called Franconia Notch. And... Mm -hmm. uh, As they entered the notch, uh, they saw this craft over the top of Cannon Mountain. And as it passed over, it was either a signal tower or a building with lights on. Betty wasn't sure, but there was a light up there. And uh, as it passed over this steady burning light, uh, the light blinked off, which could be an indication of electromagnetic interference Mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, They decided to stop again at the old man of the mountain that was only about a mile south of there and take another look through binoculars. At this point, they could see that it was probably uh, one and a half to two times the length of the old man's profile, which is 48 feet from forehead to chin. So it was quite large. Um, It appeared to be rotating. Uh, at that point, it looked cigar-shaped, uh, mm-hmm. but it appeared to be rotating. So, you know, they were seeing the row of lights, and on one side there appeared to be a, a lighted row of windows. On the other side, it was dark. So they were seeing this blip, blip, blip of it, as it seemed to be rotating. And uh, then it would it started to shoot in toward them and move back and move in a stair step pattern. Um, they they got back into the car <laughs> and started <laughs> driving south. They decided that they would get out of Franconia Notch. There, <laughs> that was a they pretty desolate area. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. At that point, okay. they were becoming frightened because this was completely silent, and uh, you know, so they wanted to get out of there. They they exited Franconia Notch at an area called Indian Head, and this is where the tourist attractions began, the motels. They passed a a group of cabins and uh, talked about maybe they would, they could stop there, but Betty was so curious, she didn't want to stop for the night, and Barney wasn't tired. So uh, Betty was becoming excited that this was coming in so close, and Mm -hmm. Barney decided he was going to stop again. But before he had the opportunity to stop, the craft shot ahead of them, and stopped um, right over the the highway, causing them to have to stop the car almost directly underneath it. Wow. Barney, I just to, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Barney jumped out of the car. He took the binoculars that he had on the seat, and he had also removed a gun from the trunk of the car. He was afraid uh, that bears might come out of the woods in that desolate area when they were uh, stopping to look at this thing. Uh, so he had that in his pocket, and he's looking up at this craft, which is now only about 100 to 200 feet above their car. And they could see this lighted row of windows. And as he was looking up at it, it shifted location again to an adjacent farmer's field. There were a few apple trees in the field and a farmer's stand. He walked into the field toward it while Betty remained in the car. And the internal light in the car was on. The door was open. And uh, so she couldn't see very well because it was lighted inside there. 
but she was calling for Barney as he was walking into the field, and he was there longer than she wanted him to be. She was worried about him. Uh, he yes. was in the field looking up uh, through the windows of this craft at what he stated immediately uh, were figures dressed in black, shiny uniforms. Uh -huh. And he told the original NICAP investigator that they were somehow not human. He was mm -hmm. greatly frightened by them, especially when all but one left the window and moved to a panel, and their arms went up in the air, and when that happened, the craft tipped in his direction and started to descend. Something started to drop out of the bottom of it, and that is when he became so frightened. He pulled the binoculars away from his eyes and ran back to the car screaming to Betty that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. He told the original investigator that he thought they were going to be captured like a bug in a net. It seemed that they had a plan, and that plan was to take him. And so he got into the car and went speeding down the highway. He told Betty to look up because when he ran to the car, he noticed that the craft was following him back there. She looked up, rolled down the window, looked up, put her body out. Uh, all she could see is blackness. She was expecting to see the lights on the craft. She did not see any lights. But then suddenly, uh, when she pulled her body back in to the car, the car, uh, they heard a series of buzzing, code-like buzzing sounds that seemed to be striking the trunk of the car where it was magnetized mm -hmm. later on. And uh, there was a tingling sensation that started to pass through their bodies, and the car was vibrating. And the next thing they knew, they were 35 miles down the highway with very little memory of what had happened in the interim. They knew that uh, they had encountered a roadblock somewhere along the way. They didn't know where or when that occurred. They remembered observing a bright fiery orb. Uh, it seemed to be in the road uh, as they thought about it later on uh, when they arrived home. They realized that it was moving, but they were not moving at that point. Very, very perplexing. Uh, they heard a second series of buzzing sounds, and uh, Barney tried to create that sound. Betty said, now do you believe in flying saucers? And, <laughs> and Barney said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I, I can, it must be the car. And so he stopped the car. He was driving it from one side of the road to the other, trying to make that sound. He could not make that sound. Wow. And, uh, then, he, then they drove home. They were looking for a police officer. They were looking for some place that might be open. For They wanted human contact. Right, they yeah. A cup of coffee. Uh, they, they couldn't find anything on the way home. And well, at least they, they put them back on their road home and not on another direction. They from 35 miles down the road yeah. towards home. Yes, they were 35 miles down the road towards home when they became aware of where they were again, and then they drove home from there. Uh, which so were they, they um, like in a hypnotic state in driving, uh, like, or were they just deposited the car at all? Well, my theory is that they were deposited. Okay. I don't know that for certain. And it's not really clear in their memories uh, on the hypnosis tapes. As I listened to the tapes, uh, Dr. Simon said to each of them, and they were hypnotized separately, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Simon imposed amnesia at the end of each session so that they couldn't contaminate each other's information. Plus, the content of what they were remembering was uh, simply so uh, traumatic and distressing, he didn't want them to remember it suddenly. But uh, what they each said separately is that uh, they heard the buzzing sounds on the trunk of the car, and then suddenly they found themselves on a new road, and there were tall trees all around. And then they turned off from that road onto a dirt road, and standing in that dirt road were men in the road. And Barney saw a red glow as well um, that seemed to be in the wooded area 
to uh, the left of, of him. And then these beings just started to approach the car. They divided into two groups. Three went to Barney's door. Three went to Betty's door. There were two others that stayed back be, behind them. Uh, they started talking. And, um, you know, Barney said to Betty, I think it's them. And Betty said, who do you mean? And, and uh, he said, the ones I saw are in the field. Betty was terrified. She tried to open the door and run into the woods and hide. Uh, she was intercepted before she could do that. They were taken down a path in the woods and onto a landed craft. Uh, Barney said he felt like he was floating, and uh, only the toes of his shoes seemed to be bumping along the rocks, and then he could feel them slide up this uh, ramp on mm -hmm. the craft and uh, bump over the top of it. They were taken into separate examining rooms and uh, given a very strange kind of examination. These ETs seem to want to know the difference between human beings and themselves, but from the examinations, I have the impression that they had done this before. Um, so did they take all their, remove all their clothes to do this examination? No, so they, they, didn't, they didn't remove all of their clothing. They didn't strip them naked. Um, mm -hmm. They did remove Betty's dress, uh, but she had her underwear on. They just pushed it up or moved it around. Um, they were very interested in Betty's and Barney's skeletal structures. Uh, they, they pulled uh, Barney's trousers down to his ankles. They pulled his shirt up. Uh, they were interested in their skin, their hair, uh, in their nervous system. And then they uh, took reproductive samples from both Betty and Barney. They plunged a needle into Betty's navel. They told her it was kind of a pregnancy test that mm -hmm. they were doing. She said, that's no pregnancy test here because certainly <coughs> we didn't have amniocentesis back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Barney, they placed a cup over his uh, lower abdomen and extracted semen. Oh, okay. Well, that's not typical of how other people report it, but that's very interesting. What did the beings look like? Did you get a description? Were they the greys from, like, Communion and, and uh, Whitley Striver, or were they some other type of being? Well, from the descriptions that Betty and Barney gave, they seemed like pretty typical grays. They, uh, they had spindly arms and legs. They had barrel-shaped torsos. They were bald. They had grayish, bluish skin, uh, almost nothing for a nose, just a slit for a mouth, uh, only tiny holes for ears. Uh, they had large wraparound eyes. The only difference is the eyes that Betty and Barney saw were not black, not those black glistening eyes that are so often reported today. They were more like cat's eyes. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of black in them, but there was also uh, gold and uh, a vertical slit for a pupil. Interesting. How tall were they? Uh, there were two well, groups. On, on the craft, one group was about uh, five feet tall, and the other group, uh, Betty saw one of these that she recalled standing in the hallway, just like the guards of today, and it was about uh, three, three and a half feet tall. Its mm -hmm. head was larger in proportion to its body than the taller ones, and it appeared to have a job to do, uh, and that was to act as an assistant or a guard. Were they examined in the same room or taken to separate areas? They were taken to separate rooms. Mm -hmm. And they didn't encounter any other humans. They were the only humans on board? They were the only humans on board as far as I knew. So this part that you're conveying to us, that was all conscious recall or was this a combination of conscious and what was retrieved under hypnosis? What you hear now is conscious and what was retrieved. They remembered everything except for the abduction itself uh, mm -hmm. by the time they went in to see Benjamin Simon for the first time. And actually Barney 
in uh, an abreaction in my childhood home as we were attempting to help him to retrieve some of these memories, he did remember the roadblock and those non-human entities standing in the road and how they walked with kind of an unusual gait as they, they approached his vehicle. So this uh, Benjamin Simon, he recorded everything and then he erased their memories. When did they, did he give them, eventually give them recordings and then was he there when they listened to what they had said? How did that pan out? Dr. Simon uh, hypnotized them separately uh, for a period of six months. Betty and Barney saw him for that length of a time, uh, once a week, every Saturday once morning. And, wow. and um, the first say three or four months uh, were the, the hypnosis sessions, and the last couple of months was the therapy, where um, he put them in a room together with him and uh, helped, and they listened to their statements under hypnosis, and then he helped to integ- them to integrate that information and to accept that and to work through the emotional trauma. Were you actively in their life when they were undergoing this uh, hypnotherapy? Yes, and did I you see change with them? Uh, when Dr. Simon was permitting them to remember uh, what had happened to them, they would stop by uh, on their way home from Boston. And uh, they'd stop at my grandparents' farm. And, of course, I grew up across the street from there, so the family would gather in my grandmother's dining room, and and, uh, mostly Betty would fill us in on what had been said and what happened. So she was more comfortable talking about it than Barney? Yes, I think she was more comfortable talking about it than Barney was. Wow. So they, they eventually started to integrate the story into their psyche and get comfortable with it. So, uh, what was it like after they did all this therapy? Were they more relaxed? What was going on? How did you they see were, them? They were much more relaxed. Uh, Barney had been the, the real patient here to see Dr. Simon because he had developed symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, had difficulty sleeping. He had developed bleeding ulcers that wouldn't <laughs> recede with traditional medical treatment. He had to take a leave of absence from work. Um, because of the impact that this had had on him. And so uh, he was greatly relieved after that. He was able to refocus on his civil rights activities and uh, became highly productive again and wanted to just go on with his life and forget about this and um, you know, just be proactive. What, Betty, what prevented the- him? What prevented him from uh, just uh, uh, not saying anything and not being public? What happened? Uh, He did not want for it to become public, but he and and Betty in 1963 had gone to uh, the two-state study group, which was a UFO group in Quincy, Massachusetts. And the reason they went is they were invited by a member of the group uh, to go down be, because of the sighting that they had reported to Walter Webb. And uh, so uh, they wanted, they were very curious to find out more about UFOs and about what had happened to them. So they went down there and uh, they spoke a little bit to some members of the group. And then eventually this woman who had invited them down became very friendly with Betty and Barney. So as they were going through their hypnosis sessions in 1964, uh, she eventually heard uh, from them what had happened, uh, what had come on under hypnosis. And I believe that it was her who ended up speaking with a newspaper reporter from Boston. Uh, He lived in the same town that she lived in, And there's been a lot of speculation about how this leaked out. But as I've been able to trace the letters, uh, I'm pretty sure that she was the one who who leaked the information. Uh, The newspaper reporter had written to Betty and Barney and said that he wanted to write the story 
And they said, absolutely not. We'll lose our jobs. We'll lose our credibility. Uh, no way. And so he backed off. They refused to meet with him. But it was a big surprise when in October of 1965, those newspaper, um, the, uh, the, the, it appeared in the newspaper for five nights in a row. It was a huge shock to Betty and Barney, very, very distressing, and to the family as well. What was it about Betty's personality that you, you might have insight into why she was more receptive and didn't go into PTSD and, and then Barney did? Do you have any ideas about that? Uh, I think some of it was that Betty didn't have conscious recall of observing the non-humans, as Barney did. Mm. Barney had been uh, a soldier in World War II. Uh, he, you know, there was some, uh, he had been injured in the war. Uh, he was the man, he was African-American. He was a man who was trying to protect himself and his wife and and was rendered pretty much helpless. And and this had a big impact on him, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, given his background uh, and his social history. And for Betty, uh, she was the oldest child in the family. She was, was pretty much fearless. There's a story she used to tell about how when she was a social worker, one of her foster children uh, was uh, holed up in a motel room with a couple of escaped prisoners, and uh, the police were all outside, and um, and uh, Betty said that she went up to the hotel room and she just knocked on the door and said to the girl, "Get out here right now before you end up in jail." And, oh. and the girl actually came out. So I mean, that's an example of of how fearless Betty was uh, under these kind of uh, circumstances mm -hmm. so uh, and she was she was just very curious about this too Barney wanted to forget about the whole thing he thought that no good could come of it and that they should never tell anybody but Betty just had kind of an outgoing bubbly personality uh, if if the thought entered her mind it came out of her mouth that <laughs> sort of thing whereas <laughs> Barney oh, was more introspective <laughs> uh huh. Perfect match for each other. The opposites. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to interject here when you were describing the ship. Uh, I believe it was 1966. I had the same craft come up treetop. I did see the row of lights, and I did see the beings in there, and they were looking at me. And then I looked back at them. I I don't know why I didn't freak out, but I didn't. I just kind of stayed there watching it, and it was fully conscious and. Um, I don't think they took me, but who knows? I have to explore that under hypnosis. But I did have the same exact craft that he was describing. I wanted to go forward in time. When did the movie get made, that lovely movie with James Earl Jones? And what was the name of the actress? I remember watching that on television years ago and just being you know, totally in awe of the whole story. Do you remember the details about the movie? And how did they get from the story in the paper to a movie being made? <laughs> oh, that's a long and complicated story. Um, what had happened is, this <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, Betty and Barney agreed to speak for the first time on this uh, at a church in Dover, New Hampshire, after the newspaper articles. They were actually introduced by the public relations, public information officer at, from Pease Air Force Base. And then they spoke, and John G. Fuller, uh, an author was in the audience. He had written the incident at Exeter, uh, which was published the same year as The Interrupted Journey. And so he approached Betty and Barney and asked them if they would be interested in letting him write a book now that the story was out. And, um, and so they said they'd think about it. They discussed it with the family. And uh, so it... They did eventually let him write the book. It was published in the fall of 1966. It became a New York Times bestseller. It was published in many, many different languages. And then Barney died in 1969 from a cerebral hemorrhage. Oh. Uh, Betty went on. There was an, uh, an offer uh, 
for a movie to be made, and she engaged in that with John Fuller and Dr. Benjamin Simon. Estelle Parsons played Betty, and James Earl Jones played Bonnie. Uh, it was a very good movie, I thought. I liked it. It, yeah. it, it gave uh, the incorrect impression that everything was brought out under hypnosis for the first time. That's not true, as I had just told. But um, it was a very well-done movie, I thought. Estelle Parsons didn't totally capture Betty's personality. Betty was a, a very strong woman, um, had a very good self-image, and uh, was outspoken. And I didn't get that from Estelle Parsons. I thought that she played more of the little 60s stereotypical yeah. woman, yeah. which was not Betty at all. But uh, aside from that, uh, it was a terrific movie, I thought. I thought it was pretty good. They do tend to Hollywoodize things, but I was just um, captivated by James Earl Jones. I just fell in love with him and started following his career. And that was when I think I was first exposed to him or noticed him was uh, during that movie. So, so anyway, so how did they, what did they think about, oh, and then when did Betty die first? So they, what harm did it do that, that, that they came public? Yeah. Was there any uh, ramifications from going public? What did they think about it? What happened after that? Oh, boy. <laughs> there <laughs> were ramifications from going public. Um, Philip Class. Oh yeah, uh, is probably the the most prominent uh, disinformant anti UFO disinformant of the 20th century. Uh, started a campaign against Betty and Barney's story uh, as soon as it went public, and uh, really did a lot of damage to them, made their lives miserable. Uh, and I can also say that Barney's commission with the U.S. Civil Rights Commission was not renewed. I don't know if it was uh, because he didn't have the time to do it, because the book was published and it had to be publicized, that was part of the contract, or if they simply decided that they didn't want uh, someone who claimed to have been abducted by aliens uh, to be a representative for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. I really don't they know the answer. It have been very popular back in the 60s, the alien stories. We didn't even have Star Trek until 69, when, so it was not very progressive back then, for sure. No, it wasn't. And, uh, you know, but Betty and Barney were, were strong individuals. They were committed to the truth, um, and, and they continued on and lived uh, very productive lives. Unfortunately, as I said, Barney died at age 46 in 1989, uh, very, way too young. Uh, but Betty that, lived to 2004. I just have to correct that Star Trek came out in 66, so they were starting to pay attention to it, and they were fictionalizing these stories. So that, that might have been, you know, Barney and Betty were pioneers, and, and we're, I'm so grateful they came out with their story. And I know that had to be terrifying back then because, you know, people just weren't talking about it on that level at that point. So I really commend them and appreciate their work. But, um, okay, so back to where we were. So they came out. They had, uh, oh, Phil Klaus. He uh, he attacked me when in uh, the late 80s, early 90s when I had a, UFO discussion group at Penn State University. So he, what he did, I think at that point, would phone call me and email me. He would kind of be the first uh, email stalker type person. And somehow he found my uh, Penn State email account. So I don't know for sure how he found me. What? How did he bother them? What did he do? What was his tactics with Betty and Barney? Uh, he came in initially as being friendly and interested in their case as a UFO investigator. Um, and then um, he, he picked apart that case um, scenario by scenario, bit by bit, and distorted it and reconstructed it uh, into uh, a false scenario that he had invented that he could debunk. 
And mm-hmm. um, the way that he did it was was slowly and over time. And um, the unfortunate, the most unfortunate thing about all of this, in in my mind, is that at that point there, the public and the media uh, started to believe the false scenario. They started to believe that Betty and Barney had seen only a light in the sky. They started to believe that they didn't remember anything except for a light in the sky until Betty had a series of dreams about an alien abduction and that that Betty and Barney had only relived dreams, Betty's dreams under hypnosis. Um, Phil Class stated that uh, the reason that they uh, turned off the highway onto these narrow winding roads, he called them. They were not narrow winding roads. But he said this uh, was because Barney was was frightened of this UFO and he was trying to hide in the woods, trying to, to get away from it. Actually, think about this. It's not even logical. Uh, if you're frightened about uh, a craft hovering over your car on the highway and you're looking for a police officer, are you going to pull off onto narrow, winding mountain roads and No, no, you want to be around people. But, uh, you know, apparently people who don't know a lot about human behavior ate this up. They believed that it was true. Um, Class uh, then developed this uh, hypothesis that Betty and Barney just became lost on these narrow mountain winding roads for a couple of hours and, and then drove out. And, uh, you know, they, he said that Betty had a long-term interest in, uh, in science fiction. That was false. Um, they said that Betty had a long-term interest in UFOs. That was false. It's all in the documented evidence, the original documented evidence that I have in my files. And I present this when I lecture on the topic, and I've written about it extensively as well. Uh, he claimed that... Uh, that Betty was as calm as uh, a, a woman spending the afternoon in the supermarket when she was on the craft, but that Barney had a very strong emotional reaction. Well, I have to tell you, and I do play the tapes sometimes when I lecture, um, when those ETs stopped Betty and Barney's car in the road and the motor died, Betty was terrified. She had never been so frightened in her life, and you can hear that Mm -hmm. on the hypnosis tape. When that physician on board that craft plunged that large needle into her abdomen, uh, she experienced excruciating pain. Dr. Simon wrote in his files that uh, the trauma was so intense that he had to end the session early. Mm-hmm. But class led people to believe that Betty was as cool as a cucumber and that Barney was uh, the one who was experiencing all of this trauma. Actually, when Barney was on the craft, he was just lying quietly and immobile. He was afraid really to do anything, that he might mm-hmm. be harmed if he tried to fight back. So this wasn't a species that tried to calm them. We hear reports of certain species that, um, you know, they touch their heads or they look in their eyes, and so then the um, experiencer doesn't experience trauma or pain. So this wasn't a species that was trying to calm them. Yes, it was, yes. Oh, they were uh, trying when, to calm when Betty When Betty experienced that pain, uh, the one that I call the escort today, she called him the leader, was standing mm-hmm. by her head. And they didn't realize that she was going to experience pain she said don't do it it's going to hurt and they didn't seem to acknowledge the the fact that it would and then when she was experiencing this trauma the leader um, did touched her her temples her forehead waved his hand uh, in front of her and all of the pain went away was she able to understand what they were saying to her was it in english was it language or just symbols how was the communication she said that she, under, 
she said she understood it in English, but then Dr. Simon asked both Betty and Barney if they saw the mouths moving when they mm -hmm. were receiving this information, and they did not. So it leads me to believe that it was probably te telepathic communication, just like today. Just like today, yeah. Um, and then do you think that we're coming up at the top of the hour? Do you think that Phil Klass and his attack was instrumental in, in Barney dying at such a young age? Oh, Somehow. you know, yeah. I don't want to blame anyone on for Barney's death. All mm -hmm. I can tell you is that Barney was under a great deal of stress as stress. a result of uh, this, the violation of confidentiality. So how far do you want to go back? with that right. and where do you want to place blame strokes ran in barney's family as well but i i suspect that at age 46 it was more than just uh the genetic link i think that it was the stress that he was under uh, at that point so how did betty cope with barney's death and uh, were you there to, to comfort her at the funeral and everything I was there. In fact, after Barney died, I moved into Betty's apartment building. She owned an apartment. Okay, we're going to have to pause right there. So thank you, listeners. We'll be back in about five minutes. www.freedomslips.com forward slash season2013.htm and get your favorites. First come, first serve, 7 to 21 days of delivery. Thank you. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information ever sleeps, including me. <laughs> Later. We've got to stop it. They're going to kill us all. Tune in Tuesdays at 12 noon Eastern on Studio A to hear Tammy Adams Share her knowledge of an unknown realm on Talking With Your Angels. Join Tammy as she uncovers hidden secrets about the spiritual world of angels, ghosts, and other entities that have been with us longer than we know. Tammy is a psychic, a teacher, spiritual coach, a leader in her field, and will be sharing her information and stories with you. So join us on Tuesdays at noon on Studio A. With Tammy's guidance, she'll find out who has been watching over you from the other side. And soon you will be talking with your angel.
join Revolution Radio every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Studio B for Momentary Zen with host Zen Garcia at FreedomStrip.com, the People Station. FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Aloha, everyone, and welcome back to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at FreedomSlips.com, and I'm your host, Janet Kier Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson. And we are with Kathleen Martin. Before we go back to our very exciting show, I want to just remind everybody that Revolution Radio is listener supported. So please go over right now to that donation button and donate what you can. A dollar, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, a hundred, whatever you can donate is greatly appreciated. And we do want to thank you very much for your donation. Okay, before we get into the second part, I, I want to thank you, Kathleen, for your detailed explanation of what happened with Betty and Barney Hill. That is a monumental event that kind of set the modern era. It's on at the same level as the UFO uh, 1947 Roswell event. So Dr. Lesson wants to fast forward to number 21 in the list of questions, and I'll let you ask Well, well we, want to, we want to know about the overall patterns. You've, you've studied a lot. We've been reading and uh, studying and regressing people ourselves. And we find that uh, there's several things that we really need to more information about. One is, uh, are there a series of underground uh, alien uh, and uh, governmental bases? Did our government, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, and Nixon, make agreements with uh, the aliens that a certain amount of people could be abducted and stolen uh, and uh, have things been getting better among the contactees, as Barbara Lamb and others say, that, uh, that and Mary Rodwell, too, that now uh, the, uh, they're having fun and tuning people up and uh, making them smarter and healthier instead of just doing uncomfortable medical experiments. I'd like your feedback on some of these subjects. Oh, yes. I'd like to talk first about uh, the good things that they appear to be doing. And, you know, maybe this was part of the plan from the very beginning when they took Betty and Barney. And, and you know, I think that, you know, they probably had done it to other people before Betty and Barney, but it seemed that uh, part of what they were doing was uh, these reproductive experiments. And I have to say they were they were kind of nice to Betty and Barney. They apologized for frightening them. They they didn't uh, want to do that, uh, but you know it was just part of that process. Uh, today, they are seem to be more respectful toward people's feelings. And I do have to say, you know, there will be people who are going to become angry and say, "Well, I'm having terrible experiences." And yes. There are some people who are having terrible experiences with certain groups of ETs. They're being abducted. They're, um, they're reporting that they're being mistreated by them. But uh, among the greys, they seem to have a better understanding of human emotions than they used to. They're, they seem to be very, very interested in our emotions and, and how we respond. And I... I have a feeling that this is part of uh, their reproductive, their experimental procedure. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, when they, they take people, and this seems to run along family genetic lines, uh, they often uh, perform emotional experiments. And they're very interested in observing these emotional reactions. And then sometimes it appears that they are uh, perhaps extracting glandular material 
So they might be very interested in the hormones that are secreted um, when experiencers uh, experience fear or when they uh, experience horror or when they experience pleasure, that sort of thing. Uh, so they will construct these scenarios, sometimes as holographic images, where a person might observe uh, a family member who is deceased, and they will uh, watch for the kind of interaction, the kind of pleasure the human might see in this. Some people have been shown pets. One person that I've worked with has been shown her daughter lying dead on the floor and told that uh, that she had actually murdered her daughter. And wow. this terribly, this was terribly upsetting to this individual. The daughter was fine. This was an experiment that was being done, a holographic image. Uh, you know, so... Did they apologize for that later, or what was that? Well, Did not they... according not according to this exper experiencer. And I have to tell you, I I spoke to her almost daily for a couple of weeks. She was so distressed about this, and you had to keep reassuring her that this was not real. It was only part of an experiment that this group was doing with her. This was probably not Grace who did this procedure. Um, you know, but, we've had we've had people that have said that they've uh, seen U.S. military working together with Greys. Actually, uh, Janet actually had a, di a direct experience with this, and I wonder if you have uh, cases like this where the uh, our government uh, or soldiers dressed in our, in our government's uniforms, at least, have been assisting the Greys in abducting people against their will. Uh, certainly some people are reporting that. I have not hypnotized anyone or done an investigation of a case uh, where uh, this has been the case, uh, but certainly I'm aware of individuals who are reporting that this has happened to them, and they've talked to me directly about that. And uh, these tend to be some of the more negative experiences that so uh, people are reporting. The species that showed the poor woman her daughter dead and told her that she killed her daughter, do you have any idea what species that was? It might have been reptilians. I'm not positive about that. Mm -hmm. I haven't hypnotized this woman. She has a lot of conscious recall. Um, okay. But the greys are seem to be quite concerned about keeping our bodies in good shape. They're um, they're doing upgrades on us through changes in our vibrational frequencies uh, when we're on the craft uh, to, uh, you know, the human body passing into an ET environment, particularly if we're entering into another dimensional reality, uh, is, is difficult for the human body, I'm told. And there has been an elevated uh, level of chronic fatigue syndrome, for example, among experiencers. Experiencers who feel ill uh, sometimes come back with some burns and that sort of thing. And, and, but the greys are, appear to be uh, aware of this and doing what they can to keep us in good condition. Uh, Do you think that's why they're doing a lot of these um, abductions astrally or the, you know, Different light body or something, they're not always taking people with physically. Uh, yes, that could that's a, that could definitely be the reason for this. And uh, sometimes it seems that they are only going into people's homes and not taking them out of the homes to the craft, uh, but doing whatever upgrade they need to do right in the home. Uh, that uh, that's been reported to me as well. And of course. Yeah. People who have always, women who have always wanted to become pregnant and couldn't, have been given babies. They have, uh, they have get been able to become pregnant to, through something, through a process that they say happened on board the craft, and have given birth to to children. So there are many positive things that uh, the Greys seem to be doing for us. 
are the children clones that is the same uh, genetic as the uh, as the mother or are, is there something else are they hybrids i uh, i have never found anyone who is willing um, to undergo genetic testing uh. Uh, on the children because they fear what would happen if they found out uh, if the word got out that this was part extraterrestrial or um, or whatever. Um, they're protecting their kid. They're protecting their children. And you can imagine what would happen if that leaked. Oh, the government your child. Don't yeah. you think our government knows with all these births in the hospital, uh, they're, they're, they're implanting, uh, our government's implanting them with their first shot in the hospital? Don't you think they're aware of the hybrids? I, I suspect they are because... Well, we have all these reports from people that said there was a, a uh, an inter a, a galactic size brothel that was uh, from people that had been kidnapped under Dulce, uh, and that uh, President Carter had sent his own Delta Force in to rescue uh, some of uh, the hostages that were there, and that terrible things were going on, and that, uh, that 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 there's these different factions fighting wars among themselves, some of which have our military and CIA and NSA people uh, involved and uh, missing persons turn out often to be people according to some of these reports and so we hear all this stuff from people that I can tell you this they sincerely believe what they're telling us now I wasn't there so I don't know but I can tell you that these people believe it and so we don't know what to think can you give us some yes, I don't know what to think either I'm, I, I'm on the fence on a lot of different things and uh, I, I like to think of myself as a careful uh, conservative kind of researcher. But of course, you know, I've had some of my own experiences too. So on a personal level, I, I have my, my memories. I know what's real uh, at, at that level, at least. But, um, I've never been taken to Dulcie and I've never been taken underground <laughs> that I'm aware of. Um, I have never uh, been out there to do any kind of investigation. I know people who have, who believe that it is an underground base, that there is something going on out there, but they consider it to be very, very dangerous, and they feel that their lives might be in danger if they pursue it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so that so they sort of back off. So, you know, I really don't know. I'm like you. I'm on the fence. Well, I've had lots of experiences, and they've been primarily positive, and I've looked at them over and over from what I consciously remember and then do some hypnosis to get the parts that I have forgotten or repressed. And so I was taken to an underground installation, but my experience was, was very positive and uh, verging on spiritual. <laughs> and so... Um, so I wonder if there's something about the individual's reaction and their own um, personalities that get interjected into these experiences so they perceive them either positively or negatively or somewhere in between. What do you think well, about I that? I think that that's a very perceptive, and, and I agree with that. I think that uh, our experiences are very much a part of our uh, past emotions, our past experiences, and our, our feelings of trust, and uh, our willingness to accept this. And, you know, you have to think, we are taken uh, generally against our will. I, I certainly never asked for this to happen. I was uh, abducted, and uh, I'm taken over, uh, well, over my lifetime a few times. Uh, there are other individuals, uh, and I have a fairly positive attitude toward it. So what happened there in your experience? Other, well, let me say, there are other individuals who have had the same experiences who are outraged to say that these, these individuals have no right to take me, they have no right to do these experiments on me, and, uh, you know, if I could get my hands on them, I'd kill them. I've heard people say. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Barbara Lamb tells me that when she hypnotizes these people that say those kind of things, she finds there's a part of them that did consent. And a, almost all of them had a part that consented. 
Well, that's the same with um, the Australian researcher. Uh, I forget her name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I found that, too, that when I uh, finally, you know, I had the conscious memory and there was a point where I told them that they couldn't take me and knock me out. And so they lowered me back to the ground. They said, Mary Rodwell. They, oh, Mary Rodwell. They said, uh, we never take you against your will. This is part of your like a contract, an agreement that my soul had with them before I even came into this form as Janet. Have you found anything similar to that? Well, Barbara has told me that she has found this with many, many people. Um, Mm -hmm. I have not had anyone tell me this under hypnosis, but I haven't asked either. But did you you agree? Did you, did you, did a part of you say, uh, Okay, maybe I'm not aware of, of it, but I, I know there's a part of me that was so curious that, and I admired curiosity in, in uh, Betty, uh, that maybe, uh, that curiosity part said, let's go for it. No, 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 there isn't a part of me. I think the, what happened was that, uh, Betty was doing a series of psychophysics experiments with a team of scientists. And the goal of that was to vector a craft in to land on my grandparents' farm. And uh, a craft did come in, and it did land in February of 1966, uh, no, April of 1966. And it was observed by a commercial pilot who was returning home from work that night. It woke my grandparents up uh, from the noise that it made. Uh, after that, my mother and I both had memories. And I'm not sure if it was that the next day or when it was, but it was right around that time frame that we had memories of being taken, of finding ourselves on a table in a craft. Uh, and uh, we also started to have very strange paranormal activity in our homes for the, the, our house for the very first time after that occurred to uh, – Light orbs that seemed to be intelligently controlled, doors that would open and close on their own, that sort of thing. Uh, something would fly off the shelf. Uh, very, very perplexing. I hadn't connected it until uh, I did a research project in 2012 with Denise Stoner, and one of the questions was, have you had uh, observed paranormal activity in your home? 88%. Of 50 respondents said, yes, they had. So, uh, you know, I started to put that connection together at that time and believe that it is connected. I, I've had a missing time experience as well when I was driving. Um, and these were investigated by Dr. Uh, James Harder from APRO years and years ago. And I... I maintained anonymity for, uh, gosh, it's been 48 years now. And and I finally thought that for the benefit of experiencers and as an experiencer advocate, it was time uh, to tell the truth. And I don't go into a lot of detail about what has happened to me. It's not that interesting. Uh, other, Other people have far more interesting stories. I want to focus upon my research, but I do want experiencers to know that I know what they are going through because I've been through it as well. So, so do I guess for me, what the big emotional thing probably would be is that I want to be able to be the decider about what happens with my body, and I wonder, uh, and that's what pr- might might make some people angry that their choice was uh, not respected, and I wonder if you had any feelings like that. Absolutely. I, I, there was a time in my life when I was terrified about being taken again because you are paralyzed, because you are, uh, things are being done and you have no control over what happens to you when you're on that table. And, you know, so that you're really there if you if you want to call it a, a lab animal or a victim or uh, they say it's part of their program that you're part of the program and that How they're you, working for the program that's what they've told me okay part of the program so do you, are you aware 
do you, what is the program? Do you have any idea of what's their motive? What are they doing? Is this still the genetic hybrid program? Is it something beyond that, more complicated? And why are they doing caps? Yeah, let me ask the program first. What, what is the program from your well, impression? From my perspective, it seems to be a long, longitudinal genetic study. They are very, very concerned about uh, human behavior. We killed 200 million of our own kind in major and minor wars during the 20th century. Imagine what it would be like if we went to another planet and looked down on the inhabitants of that planet and saw them slaughtering one another and destroying the environment. They are You'd say they're insane. Yes, they're crazy. Absolutely. So what, what would we do? Would we leave? Would we decide that we were going to wipe them out? Would we start a long-term project to try to bring about change in that behavior, to, to bring them up to a point where perhaps they would be able to interact with others in the cosmic kindergarten? Um, yeah, of course, know, that's, you, what we, that's what we do, the last one, of course. I now, heard if, you're, if you're benevolent, you would. I heard from a contact experiencer who was in the military and had uh, above top secret involvement that what they were looking for is a uh, species like the guardians. They could, they could be guardians because apparently in the cosmos there are beings that are just totally uh, reptilian or, or very primitive that their major um, concern in, in existence is to simply come in and conquer other planets and kill everything that's on the planet and take their resources. So what the theory is or the hypothesis is or the story is, is that they are looking, they have bred violence out of themselves to the, to the extreme. And they realize that they need to protect themselves from these, these beings that are so violent that that's why they're looking at um, humanity because we have this violent tendency and they need some of that in order to survive this, onslaught from this other species. Have you heard that theory at all? Well, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised if they're using our genetic material uh, in order to change themselves as well, because I hear more reports of emotions coming from them now than from back in the 70s, for example, where their emotions were pretty flat. Uh, in terms of this, I've heard many, many different stories you know, it's, it's all a mythology. We, there's no evidence to prove any of this. Another story I heard was that these greys uh, were living on a planet in the Zeta Reticulum star system and that uh, thousands of years ago the uh, reptilians came to their planet to invade, that they attempted to defend themselves, and that the uh, using maybe nuclear weapons, and that the surface of their planet was all but destroyed, and that the survivors uh, live underground, and uh, that over thousands of years now that they uh, there have been changes, and that it's now safe to go above the surface for uh, a short period of time. But, and, and, you know, perhaps that is the devastation that they show experiencers uh, when they're showing dead planets uh, to us. A lot of people interpret that as being the Earth. I'm not so sure it's the Earth, but I'm not so sure that that story is an accurate one either because the, I've seen no evidence. It's just another tale that's told. Right. Are you familiar with um, Lawrence Spencer's story of uh, Errol, the Gray from Roswell, and he wrote a book called um, Stranger in the uh, White House. No, that's not. That's no, another story. One. No, oh. Alien Interview. Oh yeah, yeah. And then there's the story of J Rod. Are you familiar with those two yes, stories? Yes, I'm, I'm. I'm familiar with the story of J Rod, but I haven't read that book. Okay. Well, there's a series of YouTube's that I, I find watching a YouTube is faster than reading a book. And um, so J-Rod, I think, came in um, Kingman. There's two major incidences. There's Roswell and Kingman. And uh, Roswell, apparently, two theories was a crash, and then another theory is it was delivered. Um, they were purposely trying to uh, accelerate our progress 
um, anyway, there, there's two major stories about contact. What you gathered with the, your research and with, with Betty and Barney, did they get any indications of uh, who these beings were? What was their purpose? Um, did they did they care about humans? Were they just here for the experiment? I mean, what are you getting on that level? Well, I have to tell you with Betty and Barney, they seemed to indicate that they cared about us. Betty invited them back, actually, um, to talk to scientists. And um, that was the reason for the, the psychophysics experiments. And it, uh, the leader said to her, um, or gave that message to her, that uh, they can find those that they want to find. So that leads me to believe that perhaps they uh, were using implants way back then. There was some way that they would know how to find Betty and Barney if they wanted to find them again. Um, well, that's true from my experience. It's not research, but experience that I received my implant um, in my nose when I was in kindergarten. So that would have been, I was born in 54, so about 58, 59. I missed the school that day. I, I, my nose kept running and sneezing. It was trying to expel the implant. Uh, very clearly got an implant in my nose. And then that same summer, I got one in my ear. So we're talking about... 5859, so that was before Betty and Barney, so that was probably yeah. a common practice. And uh, I was told later by uh, a woman who was familiar with implants that she said that they are the one implant I had was a tracking device that they could keep track of me. Mm-hmm. What happened when they landed, when Betty called him in? Um, was it witnessed by everybody? Did, was she, did she go back on ship? Did anybody else see it? Well, she was, these were a, a series of experiments that she would do. Um, Homan and Jackson would give her, uh, who were two scientists on the team, would give her uh, something that would uh, they had written. And it would be, this is uh, the 53rd day of the year, and uh, we are asking you to come to, meet scientists and we ask you to land uh, at these coordinates. And so she would go out and she would uh, try to to convey this message telepathically to the ETs every single night. And what she discovered was that it took her about four months to have success. And the, the scientific team would go out to wherever they wanted her to have to vector the craft into and sometimes they actually did see craft, but they could never conclude positively that it was the result of what Betty did and that it wasn't just coincidence. Now, when it landed on the family farm, Betty was at home sleeping um, in Portsmouth. It landed on my grandparents' farm. A neighbor who was a commercial pilot was returning home from work that night and saw it coming in. Uh, it came down in a stand of birch trees. And uh, when it did, it sort of laid the, the birches out flat in a circular pattern. And what? it left physical trace evidence on the ground. There was a lot of noise when that happened. And my grandparent, it woke my grandmother up. And uh, she looked out and she was very concerned. She woke my grandfather up. And uh, they were wondering initially if the furnace had blown up, but the furnace was fine. Right. Um, and uh, the, the the commercial pilot's son called my brother the next day, next morning. And my two brothers and I went down to where their father said they saw the craft coming in and found the the landing spot. And then investigators came and took samples, and Betty came down and took samples, and uh, you know that that was about it. Were the trees uh, dead? Were the trees broken, or what? What, what about the? Did they recover? Uh, the trees were sheared off. Sheared. Wow. They were. Some of them were sheared off at about twelve feet. Did uh, anybody take photos? Broken. Uh, I, photos must have been taken. I keep looking for those photos, 
and I haven't found them yet. I don't know if I put them into the archival collection that went to the University of New Hampshire or if I have them here and just haven't found them yet, but I mm-hmm. have been looking for them. So this was your uh, your brother and, and a few other people. Have you interviewed everybody? To, uh, well, I was now? there. Okay, but I, I mean, have there. you interviewed each person individually to see if they have any more details than you, than you might yes. have? Yes. Okay. yes, I have. So... Was there a test for any uh, radiation or mag- magnetism at that time? Um, there was no testing for radiation, as far as I know, um, and no electromagnetic field testing either. Uh, mm-hmm. There was uh, a burned area in the center ah. of, of this, uh, and there were triangular impressions, three of them, in the ground. Do you think that was the, the night that you were taken, or was it a different time? I'm not sure about that. Okay, were, you, were you and your mother in different rooms, or were you two together in the same room when you were examined? We were in different rooms, but ah. um, I, I also saw her waiting in the hallway for them to finish with me. What was the table like on which you were examined? All I can remember is lying on a hard surface hard. and that there were individuals standing around me. And I have to tell you, at that time, when that occurred, I, I remembered it consciously. I had physical pain afterward, and I had the feeling that my mother knew I was afraid of doctors and that they had to be, a, I had to have a surgical procedure performed upon me, and so she brought doctors in in the middle of the night, and uh, <laughs> and ah. that they had done it in the middle of the night. That's you know that's a, a kid's Ooh. brain trying, not knowing what ha- really happened, and trying to rationalize what all of this was. Wow! And like you know, so that's what I was trying to rationalize and. Uh, you know, then my mother and I had, had discussed it, uh, and and uh, both of us had the same memories. So, <laughs> wow! Oh my gosh! So, was that the only time Betty was able to call them in, or were there other incidences when they came in and landed? Uh, that was the <laughs> only time that I'm aware of when she, she didn't call them. She just found her. She was asleep, honey. Right, but, but but she had been calling every night, so... Yes, yeah, she had yeah. been sending telepathic messages, oh. uh, and this one landed. Others were seen, but as far as I know, that's the only one that landed. And um, there was an experiment done. I wrote about it in my book, Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. And actually, I'm going to be speaking about all of this at uh, the, the uh, fire the Sky Fire Summit, which is Travis Walton's 50th anniversary conference. Wow. Uh, starting on November 5th in uh, near uh, Heber, Arizona, and it's in Overgard, Arizona. You can Google it and, and find the information online. But it, I am going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation where I'll be presenting all of this evidence and you'll be able to see uh, the evidence of Betty and Barney. You'll be able to see that experimental team at uh, Skywatch 67. And uh, this was another experiment where Betty tried to vector in a craft with the team of scientists there to my grandparents' farm. Uh, The only problem is they didn't give her the four months that she needed for it to be successful. They they received the funding, and it was like two weeks later they wanted to do it. They could get everybody in there. Jacques Vallée was there, too. Alan Hynek was supposed to be, but couldn't uh, couldn't go. So Jacques Vallée went uh, instead of him. And uh, Dr. Simon was there, John Fuller. Um, and uh, it didn't work. The experiment did not work that night, unfortunately. Betty just didn't have the time. She had already stated that it took four months. 
Right. You know, they didn't give her the time. the date of the conference. What was the date? Uh, it is going to begin on November 5th. That's a Wednesday. And uh-huh. that is just going to be uh, a bus trip out to the abduction site. And okay. then Thursday there are going to be activities uh, going out to uh, the the jail uh, and, and being able to uh, speak with individuals and hear from individuals who were there uh, who can tell what happened when the logging crew uh, was taken in and questioned and given lie detector tests about what happened to Travis. Um, mm-hmm. The conference starts on Friday evening and goes all day Saturday and on Sunday as well. Uh, be a lot of great speakers, so uh, uh, don't miss it. What's the website? Um, you can look under Sky Fire Summit. Sky Fire Summit, Okay. Okay, so we'll go on from that. So here we have Betty's trying to pull these um, ships in, and, and all these scientists are there. And what was the rest of her life like? How involved with her were you? And uh, what happened to her after Barney died, and she's left with all this by herself, and she's what happened to her? Yeah. Betty continued with her experimentation after Barney died. Uh, she did photograph uh, a couple of uh, crafts that were quite close to her, some, some very, very good photographs. Uh, she was uh, set up by Philip Class. I have evidence of that. There was a young reporter in the state of New Hampshire. He was also an artist, and he... Uh, wanted to uh, join classes, a skeptical group, and, and class sort of sucked him in and uh, put him in charge of spying on Betty and oh reporting back to class. And so actually what happened was they set up an experiment uh, where uh, Betty and, and uh, a group of uh, people went out to an area where she often saw UFOs, she said. And uh, this reporter was there, and what he said to Philip Class was that the, the something came in, and uh, the group thought it was unconventional, and that Betty uh, was in her car at the time uh, fooling around with her camera trying to get it work- to work because it was malfunctioning. Uh, but what Philip Class ended up stating on uh, radio um, that uh, was heard by millions of people is that uh, the, uh, what Betty thought was a UFO came in and only Betty thought that it was a UFO. Oh, jeez. Um, you know, so a totally false story. Uh, I have the letters that... Uh, of exchange between the young reporter in Phil Class and uh, the reporter, he must have mentioned the reporter's name as well because Betty was absolutely furious, and that seems to have been the end of the relationship between this reporter and Philip Class. But I think he got a taste of what Class was all about. Yes. Uh, but that false story has also been passed down through history. I've read about it on some modern websites, so don't believe what you read. <laughs> I have the truth on my website at Kathleen-Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N dot com, and some of the documented evidence as well. Did Betty uh, ever find peace with this before she passed? Uh, Betty, before she passed, uh, she was suffering from cancer. I was uh, staying with her and giving her hospice care. I had told her when I was young uh, that I would do that for her when she grew old in exchange for uh, her helping me to complete college. And so I was uh, was there uh, as the people from hospice would come in and speak with her. And and Betty did seem to be at peace. She said that uh, she thought that she had a wonderful life uh, that because of her experience, she had met so many people that she
she otherwise would not have met. And she thought that that was wonderful as well. She felt that she had been the first person on Earth to meet astronauts from another planet. Um, and she was very pleased with the idea that uh, that uh, she was somehow chosen, or even if it was by accident, uh, that this had occurred. Uh, she never really overcame her fear, I don't think, but she seemed to be at peace with it. Oh, that's sweet. Did, and did she ever have any um, more contacts that she talked about, or do you think that was a one-time incident, or do you think that they, the extraterrestrials maybe did, you know, other contact, maybe took her from her bed, anything like that, any indication? I very strongly feel that uh, it was not her only incident. She uh, contended that it was, but Dr. Harder did hypnotize her, and she told him in hypnosis that she was visited about once a year. Oh. Um, she, But that was not anything that she would ever admit, and I think that the reason for that was that uh, you automatically became suspect. People would say that you were a hoaxer if you said in that time frame that you had been taken more than once. Uh, people said that she was a lunatic because she claimed that she saw UFOs again. Right. Uh, you know, uh, and, and Philip Class loved to promote the idea that she was a loon. Right. A lovable, you know, a lovable kook. That's what he called her. And, so, you know, she so was not a kook at all. Pieces, what do you think she would say now with all this research, if she were still alive and all these millions of people now have been documented, what do you think she would say about all this? You know, I think that she would feel more at peace with all of this, that she would actually uh, be able to speak with, with uh, other people. She did speak with a number of people. Um, when she was alive. Um, but she also uh, felt that many people who believed they were being taken were not. She mm. thought that it was the misuse of hypnosis or um, people who just very strongly wanted this to happen were misinterpreting um, psychological experiences as being real, dreams as being real, uh, that sort of thing. And she did write a book about this, A Common Sense Approach to UFOs, that was published oh. in 1995, about her attitude toward all of this. Um, you know, so in a sense, I think she wanted to, to feel special. That, uh, But, uh, you know, so, but I think that she would have been okay with it. I suspect that she'd be very, very proud of me for the research that I have done the investigation that I have done uh, in, into all of this. And I do think that she had more experiences. I, I have her files. She uh, wrote one account of how she was, had been visiting my grandmother with her upstairs tenant, who was a friend of hers, and that on the way home, the UFO came down close over the car, and that it, it, uh, a light was shining into their car, and um, the the tenant after that said she would never ride with Betty again. Uh, <laughs> I it makes me wonder, you know, if there was missing time. I don't know if there was, but you know, generally when UFOs would do that, it was because because they were interested in the occupants inside the car. They weren't just coming down to say hello and mm -hmm. then leaving. Uh, in another case, Betty was with another tenant uh, down to visit my grandmother again. On the way home, a UFO came down. They felt the car almost lift up as if it were going up a hill. And then wow. the next thing they knew, uh, about three miles down the road, they felt the car softly come down, back down on the road. Uh, I suspect that that car was, was taken up. Yeah, I, I wonder if they did experiments on the car too. <laughs> yeah, you know that's that is typical of what occurred in that time frame. Mm -hmm. So you know, I suspect that happened. And when I was taking care of Betty, 
and her daughter was also taking care of her. We'd take turns. Her daughter lived out in Arkansas, so she would fly and spend the month and give me a break. I'd be home with my husband, and then I'd be back living with Betty. And um, I went over one day. I always went over at 8 o'clock every morning anyway. And uh, they were quite concerned because something had happened the night before. Uh, they always, uh, or Betty wasn't able to walk at that time. Her legs were paralyzed and one of her arms was paralyzed. She had uh, cancer throughout mm-hmm. her body. And uh, her daughter had set the deadbolt lock on the door the night before. And when she woke up in the morning, the door was wide open. Well, uh-huh. E.T., I don't, I don't know about that part because E.T.'s usually pass through walls or right. windows. But uh, other things were strange. She and Betty felt strange the next morning. They were always awake by 6 o'clock in the morning. Here it was, 8 o'clock, and they had just woken up. Neither of them were dressed. The shades were still drawn. Um, And the most interesting thing to me was that her cat, Raisa, who was Betty's constant companion, was Uh terrified of Betty and stayed away from her for an entire week. She hid under the bed, and uh, the only reason she would leave that bedroom, and Betty was sleeping in the living room at that point, uh, the only reason the cat would leave that uh, under the bed in the bedroom would be to skirt the perimeter of the living room, looking very, very nervously at Betty as she went out to her food dish. That was it. A uh, very, very strong reaction from this cat. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, Betty's health seemed to improve wow. uh, after that. And her skin, her pallor had been kind of grayish, and um, her eyes were dull. And suddenly, she had a rosy complexion, and her eyes were sparkling, and she started to feel better. And we had great hopes that she had been cured, but wow. she wasn't. Um, this lasted for about a week, and then uh, she didn't feel well again, and, and she took on a great pallor again. Uh, she lived about four months longer mm-hmm. after that. But, uh, you know, so they, they did not come back and cure her, but I, I suspect they came back. They came back and gave her a few more months. What was your question? So? Oh, I just, uh, we're almost through, and I just wonder if you have, have any advice for experiencers. Yeah, you said you're an advocate for experiencers. What do you mean by that? Well, as an advocate for experiencers, I, I believe that experiencers have the right to uh, be able to be, to uh, have respect, to be treated with consideration that Individuals who have these experiences should not be laughed at. Uh, in our society, people think that it's okay to make fun of UFOs and experiencers. If you go into a restaurant and people know uh, someone might be twirling their finger around like a UFO and making a, uh, you know, a strange sound, right. uh, uh, just uh, people think that it's okay to poke fun at individuals who have these experiences. It is not. And I'm an advocate for individuals' rights, uh, for for people to keep their jobs. I know of individuals who have lost their jobs uh, when they've either had an interest in this topic or they have been abducted themselves. Uh, university professors uh, are tend not to advance in their careers. I know of uh, a scientist, who, an astrophysicist who was working on a federally funded job uh, who had an interest in this topic. He was told to drop that interest uh, is, uh, and keep his job, that well. if you work for, with, and your project is funded by the federal government, it uh, is not okay to have an interest in this field. So do you think we're ever going to get disclosure on this? Are things improving? Well, I think that experiencers everywhere are disclosing this, that Uh that people are presenting evidence that this 
is real. Is the federal government going to come clean? I doubt it. Right. I think well, that if we have disclosure, it will probably be from experiencers and from the ETs themselves. So we're looking at the uh, – earlier you mentioned that the now that the – it's kind of like the, the, the material has been polluted because the story's out there and people – might have a tendency to, you know, want to be an experiencer subconsciously. How do you ascertain the authenticity of the report, that it's something that's real or not real, or, or a combination well, of real and fabrication? First of all, uh, if you're an investigator, then you're looking for evidence that it's real. Are there witnesses? Um, is there physical and physiological evidence? I found very high electrical field readings on the bodies of five separate experiencers uh, very shortly after they claimed they'd been taken. Uh, mm. the, the meter read, uh, it spiked to 100, which is 1,000 volts per meter from 10 feet away. Um, very high readings. You have to, to look for radiation. If, they've been, if they're in an external environment, say they're taken from a car, which rarely happens today, but sometimes it does. Um, mm -hmm. in, in one case, uh, there was a man who was out fishing in his boat, and uh, his, he was taken, and he, there was a GPS on his boat that registered uh, something very strange, like it was taken. Wow. Out. And then the boat was put back down in a stump field. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, there, so there, there are things, uh, there are patterned marks on experiencers' bodies. Uh, there's, you can look for fluorescence. Uh, take a black light into a dark room and check your body out to see if there uh, is fluorescence on your body. If there is, uh, photograph it without a flash. Um, oh. And that, that serves as evidence. Keep a diary. If you're an experiencer, keep a diary. And whenever you have an experience, write down immediately everything you can remember. Um, the date, the time, all of your memories. Uh, and then check your body out. Take a human body chart. They have them online. Just, just search for one, print it out. And mark where, where, where that bruise, where that... Um, a cut out piece of flesh was whatever it is where it was the size of it photograph it it's very important if you want to have credibility if you want to trying to prove to somebody else that this happened to you that you have evidence that it did what about those scanners i was at the ufo congress and there's someone that has an implant scanner have you ever seen that machine and do you think it's accurate yes well, Steve Colburn is a material scientist who worked with Roger Lear. And uh -huh. it was Steve uh, who had it when I was at the UFO Congress. And he also had it at a MUFON symposium as well. And um, some of the, some do appear to uh, show up on scanners. Um, you know, Steve is a scientist. He's doing this scientifically. He's not a quack. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll probably get scanned this year. I never, I never did it before. But I'm going again in February, and I'll go get scanned. Okay, so you've got your markings, and you're looking. Um, do you find that there are uh, joint abduction experiences at all in your research, or is it solitary people? Oh, absolutely. In our book, uh, the book I wrote with Denise Stoner, The Alien Abduction Files, I wrote about a case where two of the experiencers, Denise and Jenny Henderson, uh, separately didn't know each other, but described the same craft to me and seemed to be describing the same scene inside that craft. And um, Denise actually described a woman that she observed on the craft who had the physical appearance of Jenny Henderson. And then um, I started questioning Jenny more and about who she recalled seeing on the craft. And she described the, the pajamas that Denise was wearing 
on that particular night. They described how both of them found themselves that seemed to be standing outside on a balcony on this huge, it, it sounded like a triangular-shaped craft. It was a very large one. They, mm -hmm. they described the other people uh, that they observed and um, the activity that they were taking part in. I found a third person who also independently described that same craft and a very similar activity to me. So, yes, some people meet each other for the first time and recognize having seen each other on a craft. I had two different boyfriends about four years apart. It, you know, once it, we got involved, I started to go through their childhood pictures. And when I got to their photos at a certain age, my jaw dropped because I had seen that little boy. And here we were many years later, you know, 20, 30 years later, and we were having a relationship. And that happened twice. Have you ever found any stories where people are reunited years later and they may have been taken as children together? Hmm. Um, not off the top of my head. Uh, I do know the story of Audrey Hewins, who is another person that I wrote about in the book. She is actually the director of Starborn Support. And Matt Moniz, who is a scientist, um, and Audrey met for the first time at a concert and recognized each other um, and had seen each other on the craft before. Uh, I'm not sure if they were children at that time or not, but uh, yes, you know, anything is possible, I say. <laughs> we have about two more minutes. Are there any cases that you have researched that stand out in your mind that we need to tell our listeners about? Oh, boy. Well, you know, I think that the case of Denise Stoner um, that I, we've written about in the alien abduction files definitely stands out in my mind because this is a case that started very much like my aunt and uncle's case but went on, um, and later we discovered that this is probably a lifetime of abductions and that Denise's mother and, and father had an experience when they lived in Connecticut um, as well. And it appears that they were probably taken. Uh, her mm -hmm. father is deceased. Her mother is now in her 80s. Uh, and um, so, Denise, there are many messages that Denise has received, uh, many memories that uh, she had conscious recall for but were enhanced through hypnosis as well. Uh, very, very interesting story indeed. And uh, Denise is a very credible person. She's on MUFON's abduction research team, uh, long-term history uh, as a MUFON investigator. She was chief investigator in the state of Florida. So she knows what she's doing. She's a credible woman, highly intelligent, knows how to investigate these cases and has a very fascinating story that appears to be ongoing. Also, what the case it? of Jenny Henderson that I wrote about in the book is the case I uh, investigated for many years. How do people reach you? Uh, Kathleen-Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N dot com. Thank you so much, Kathleen, Thank you, for being Kathleen. on the show today. It was fascinating. My pleasure. Come to the conference.